dweller. A chud, all right? It's dead. Come, ladies and gentlemen, we're back from the depths of hell. Ooh, spooky. It's two guys and some horror with a movie we've been waiting to do ever since Bud showed his face. And that movie is Chud, the movie without Bud, which, for good or bad. Now, Curtis, as my uh, always companion here, how you doing today, buddy? Uh, I'm good. I'm glad to be back in the studio. In the studio. I am in my house. <laughs> Come on, man behind the curtains. You're not supposed to tell them that. Well, you're right. I'm in your basement. Uh, <clears throat> Curtis has me locked down house. here. <laughs> it took him a month to track me down and find me and get us back to recording. And unfortunately, this is... I'm getting fed fish heads. It's pretty gross. But, Curtis, what did you think about Chud? So, um, I like the movie. I think it's very slow-paced at the beginning. Um... But once it actually starts to pick up, it's a lot of fun. It's it's a really great 80s horror flick. You don't like the segment where they talk about the pimple on her butt and how she's putting makeup on to cover it? No. The whole beginning of this movie could be cut, and I'd be fine with that. I love the beginning. I thought it was a great introduction to the characters. I don't Yeah. I don't know. Difference yeah. of opinion. Well, they don't, the very beginning, like with the, the chud kind of reaches out and pulls the lady and the dog goes down with her. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty decent introduction to a film. I love the and opening they, scene. Thought that that was really fun. Yeah. I thought the introduction was necessary, and they kind of introduce the homeless people. Then they start talking about the the homeless underground dwellers, the undergrounders. Yeah, you start getting um, like some ideas about homeless folks missing. Cooper's, mm -hmm. you know, getting phone calls from Derek, and the journalist is wanting the photos from him, and all that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I. They're definitely trying to build the story, I guess, um, or they're building like you know the background, everything that's going on. I guess why I, why I'm not a fan of it is it. I, I wrote down notes like 23 minutes into the film, and we finally start getting more of an idea of what's going on, and then 40 something minutes into the movie, and we finally get some real exposition that clarifies what's going on, and then the movie's over in another you know 27 minutes or whatever. So. That's a really long time and, and really big gaps of the 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 acting has to carry, right? Uh -huh. And I just feel like it, it didn't for me personally. I felt like it wasn't as, you know, I think the acting in this movie is pretty average. Low, so low my bar. gripes, my gripes with the film wouldn't is more so the direction of the film itself. It was a little... ADHD. It felt like they were filming a bunch of scenes and then they just tended to paste them together. Like the scene where she's like in the shower and she's like trying to clog, unclog the drain because like water's filling up and she's taking a shower and she pokes it with like a hanger and then just blood squirts out, goes all over her. And then like two scenes later, she's completely calm and she's like fluffing up flowers and putting them in a pot. I don't, <clears throat> I really feel like they just grabbed a bunch of scenes and then just jammed them in out of order. Yeah, a lot of a lot of that later on scenery with uh, with Lauren, I don't get. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it was necessary or what the importance of that moment for her was. I don't even know if they were trying to make a point at all, realistically, um, because she ends up just running out of her apartment, jumping in a cop car, you know, and then heading to the guys. How to, she to knows? Point. Yeah. No, no, no. To your point, too, like, there's a lot of, like, your previous point where there's, like, a lot of fluff in this movie that doesn't really need to be there, where she's talking about how she's pregnant to George. None of that had to be there. Like, the there was that, the reporter talks to George, he's like, I want to make a story about this. We never see that character right. in a meaningful way again. <laughs> uh, what's the purpose of the conversation in the park? None. Could have cut that. Could have cut the whole baby conversation. Her being a model, sure. Him being a photographer, Yes. Him writing up a story about this. Perfect. That connects to the film. Uh, but the one thing like all movies do, not just horror movies, is they always try to find ways to connect every single character to the film or or the subject matter, which I hate. I hate it. Why can't you just have a character that's not connected and just kind of gets pulled in because they're related or they're involved with one of the people that is attached already? Yeah, when you start I, there's a lot going rough, on, right? Yeah, yeah, it's 
get rid of the uh I don't know. I think they put her in there because they needed a romantic lead, and that was just one of the things they did in the days. But yeah. I mean, so yeah, looking at her, uh, this is maybe diving too deep into her IMDb, but I mean, so Kim Grease, this is her first feature film. She literally, mm -hmm. you know, hasn't done anything before. This is her big break. I don't think it was a good first film for her, personally. I think... Mm -hmm. She could have done so much more or had had a better part where she was more of a lead role. She was definitely just a afterthought character, right? right. Someone for John Hurd's character to be with and, and, and their relationships even a bit rocky, right? Because she tells right. him she's pregnant. That whole scene where we're like, yeah, we could do without this. The whole scene, she's like, I'm pregnant. And he's like, oh, that's cool. You're pregnant. You, you're pregnant. Like me as a husband, knowing, you know, when my wife got pregnant, I was so excited, right? Because, you know, we as a couple knew where we were going. They clearly didn't have that same, like, we want to have a kid one day and settle down kind of a feel. They were still very much so two individuals. And it just so happened that she got pregnant. So, yeah, for, right. I don't know. It, it's a, I could definitely leave Most, it for sure, but it was yeah. funny. Most actors in this film are TV actors or movie TV actors, or initially were. Like John Hurt, he's been in a lot of stuff. Like he's had a he was the dad in uh, Home Alone, and uh, which we'll get into later. And Marv from Home Alone as well played the Reverend for our three main male leads. But <clears throat> even even Christopher Curry, who's the captain, Captain Bosch, he's been in a Home Alone film. So fun yeah, fact, but not the same one. No, but fun fact, all three have appeared in Home Alone films. <laughs> right. John Hurd, the father McAllister, and Marv being the sticky bandit. Yes. Uh, I have a fun theory of making this a prequel to Home Alone, which we'll get into. But It's good. We'll get there. Is it good? We'll find out. Yeah, put a pin Next in it. Next time on Dragon Ball Z. All right. <laughs> Next time on what Dragon do you Ball have? Z. What do you have for us, Curtis, on terms of like, because you were saying something earlier, and I'm sorry I kind of derailed your train of thought there, but... Before I started talking about how the fluff with Lauren kind of just wasn't necessary. They kind of just jammed a bunch of shit in here to make a movie. I I just, I know, I don't know. I just feel like it's, it's, there are movies that do it well where every character has a different connection to someone else, right? So like in this case, in our film, those three male, male characters are our leads. You, you've got Captain Bosch. Um, who's like the police officer who's trying to figure out what's going on, stumbles right. across, you know, has his desk lady give him some information, stumbles across these missing persons. Okay, bam. Mm -hmm. So now he's hooked mm -hmm. into it. You've got the reverend who's running this homeless shelter who uh, clearly has a connection with the captain because they know each other from previous uh, experiences, right? He threw him in jail at some point in his <laughs> exactly. career. Exactly. And he's really surprised that this guy's running a homeless shelter and helping all these people. Well, the Reverend is uh, worried because 12 of his patrons have gone missing and calls upon Captain Bosch. At the same time, right. you have Cooper, who's the photographer, who's done a previous piece on the homeless people living underground, um, which ties him to the Reverend. Now, Cooper right. and Bosch, I don't think, have any official tie. So Reverend to, Reverend to me is the main centerpiece that holds all of them together. But that's... Not that's, very strongly. <laughs> yeah, but that's how we Weakly. get stuck in the glue, I guess. Well, remember that line? He's like, remember me? It's it's Remember me, a uh, shepherd? I run, the, I run the soup kitchen? Oh, you deliver. That yeah. Was, thank God. Okay. <laughs> thank God you deliver. Well, he's saying because... I Ad lived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of little one-liners in here that I agree with you definitely feel out of the script. Um, and they were, you know, ad-libbed on the moment, whatever, that work. And then there's some that just don't work. Um, right. I, like my favorite quote was uh, Marvin or whatever his name is, the journalist who's going after Cooper, trying to figure out what Cooper's uh, – why he's so popular, right? And his quote was when they're down in the sewer, he's like, you said you Victor said knows something. something. If he wants a gun, gun, I want a gun. gun. And like in that moment, I totally agree with him. Like I would, if that guy wanted a gun to go down in the sewer, I would want a gun to go down in the sewer because something is not right down there. You know what I mean? So if, I guess for every six good ones, we're going to get six bad ones when it comes to ad-libbed uh, commentary. But um, 
at the end of the day, I guess my, my main point that I was trying to get with all the different pieces coming together is you have some movies that do it really well, especially in the horror genre. Um, I think of Trick or Treat whenever I think of a good six different stories coming together to kind of big one giant um, anthology film. This is not an anthology, but does have kind of these three different people's lives going on in New York City that come to come to a head, and it kind of right. works. It's not great, but it works. I mean, it's a it's not a bad film. No, I don't. I no. not, neither of us think that. We both no. enjoy it. I think the monsters are, are perfect. I love them for a 1980s film, like in 1980 itself, like just breaking out of the seventies, the costumes are pretty decent. Dude, these monster designs um, are way better than that Canadian film. We watched, uh, the gate, the little dudes, the little creatures look like, you think so. yeah, they look like mini versions of this, like the eyes glowing, the, they were actually like oozing and they didn't just look like rubbery suits. You know what I mean? The, the the mouths and the masks looked really good, but that's also – you have to take the budget into consideration when you For talk sure. about that. For um, sure. But Gate was, Gate's a better film in terms of like pacing and characters. Story, acting, characters. Story. Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I would actually agree the effects in Gate were a bit better because with the smaller – like they may look better or the monsters in Chud may look better, but those small monsters, you know, they looked like small, as goofy as it was, a little bit of claymation in there. The big monster looked terrible, but that's because it didn't age well. Sure. Otherwise, <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you otherwise. I mean, it's also hard when you think about it, like these creatures, right? All these scenes that they're shooting, um, the underground scenes, I'm not really sure where the location yeah. was for those. But everything above ground had to have been pretty expensive as well on the budget because it is in New York City. And I'm sure shutting down streets is, is not cheap. Um, right. I, I mean, these... I don't know. They're they're on the streets of New York City trying to film, and it seems like they're just, you know, regular folks. So, you can see people walking by and driving by. It's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Let's let's kind of paint the picture for our audience as well of kind of what what these monsters look like. If you've seen Creature from the Black Lagoon, kind of looks like that with glowing yellow eyes, and the mouth is done really well. That's probably the best part where you can kind of see its mouth opening and closing. Uh, I would say just the mask itself is the best part. Everything else is a little too. The claw was good goofy. in the beginning. I don't know if they used the same claws for the full suits whenever the dudes are in them. Um, Doubt it. But the claw coming out of that sewer grate when it attacks uh, the the first victim, which, by the way, fun fact, is the real wife of Daniel Stern, um, who oh, plays Reverend. Um, so that that's just, you know, audience, fun fact for you there. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that claw was pretty good it looked pretty good i recommend uh googling these images guys as well just so you're kind of on board with what we're talking about right now uh because i know it might be a little a little confusing especially if you scene... didn't especially if you didn't watch the movie before you listen to us yeah. i really love it when uh you guys actually watch these movies uh you know before listening to the episode or have seen them previously because it's really helpful and we get some really nice conversations going on on twitter whenever you guys uh check them out so uh, yeah, pull up the pictures while you're listening to us, or um, if you know what it looks like, you'll know exactly what we're talking about, which is a lot of fun. And even if you haven't seen it, like there's a – with kind of moving off the, the way the monsters look, if we go back to the acting, a lot of this movie was ad-libbed, and it shows the character who plays Marv in Home Alone plays Shepard, who is one of the, one of the main roles. He, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, I don't have his name off the top of my head. But Daniel Stern. Daniel Stern, correct, mm -hmm. correct. That's right. AJ, the Reverend Shepherd. Uh, he, I know he's he's your favorite character, mm -hmm. but in my mind, he's <laughs> one of the weakest actors. Because in the scene where they're they're kind of in a conference room and they're talking to the the government guy, and they're like, that scene was just all over the place and a mess, and I don't want to talk about that in general. But when he's like. I have these pictures, man. Oh, oh, now you're interested? Look, look here, look here, look here. That's a bite mark. And they get the guy to talk, and I'm like, he talks? Why Why is he talking? And then he's like, I'm going to tell the news. Go ahead. You have nothing on me. It's like, why did you talk? None of this makes sense. And he's just, he's like, he's upset. And he's like, you could tell when he's in the moment and acting, like he's doing a bad job kind of grabbing the lines, and he's kind of stuttering and trying to pull them out. And me having acted in the past not very well, I could tell like this is kind of this is one of his first roles. 
Yeah, Daniel, maybe... Daniel Stern's not one of the best actors, right? We know that. Um, we've seen him in, in quite a few films. Um, I, I mean, one of the, the earliest films I remember seeing him in as well was uh, Little Monsters with Fred Savage uh, back in the day. And even in that movie as the dad, he's he's not the best actor. He doesn't deliver his lines thoroughly, but I also feel like he tries to like he tries to change the lines to fit his style and i think his style is kind of clumsy to be honest um i like daniel stern I, most people like daniel stern like he's not like a terrible actor i don't think he's a terrible actor i think this film shows his inexperience yeah i think his line well that and his line delivery is just always kind of off it's not it's, it's never sweet. it's never crisp yeah um, but it's when he plays when he plays Marvin Home Alone and Home Alone Two, yep. that fits his style perfectly because it's a bumbling, um, you know, thief kind of a feel, a robber, and he's but that's not like seven to ten years later. Yes, I don't think he gets better, man. Like if you, you look don't at, think so? Nah, when I watch a lot of his movies, I don't like because even Little Monsters is quite a few years after this, and he's How still not, in that. he's still not very good in that one. Like his line delivery is a little weak um sure. yeah, see, where's my where's my remote hey hey uh ki kids have you uh see, seen my remote like i just don't feel like he's confident in his line delivery but um i don't know i mean interesting yeah i mean i like we'll to... i like daniel stern i just don't think he's as strong of an actor as say like john hurd in this film right or even we're gonna have to go through Curry. little monsters oh it's 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 gonna have to be one of our fun like around halloween uh watch it with your kid because that's probably the best time to do it not a lot of kid halloween horror movies out there that are, are safe for kids but that's one of them for sure we did it Ernest scared stupid last year remember right yeah but anyways okay so let's let's try and get back on track a little bit here that i want to talk about that uh scene in the in the room a little bit um because that's where we finally get that exposition that's the 43 minutes in which which room are you talking about? Are you talking about the meeting room? They're... Oh yeah, that that's terrible. Let's talk about it then. What do you what do you want to say about that? I just have a couple of points that I want to talk about. So like, this scene makes me feel and and we're not a political uh, podcast at all. This is purely about horror films. But this scene, when I was watching it, made me feel exactly like what we're going through right now with like COVID stuff, right? So. Mr. Wilson is a, is a total low life dirtbag who doesn't care if people are dying, doesn't care if people are going missing. He's telling them, you know, he tries to tell people it's a big hoax. He's trying to cover it up. And then he's more worried about his image than he is for the safety of the city. As a government official, he's trying to make sure that, you know, this all gets swept under the rug and, and everything goes fine with Chud. Because that's where we finally actually get the <laughs> name from the briefcase when Reverend throws it and leaves the room. You know, Captain you have Bosch to give it to it him, though. <laughs> He's committed to his job. They wrote the character very well, especially at that ending scene where he has the gun. He's like, are you going to kill a cop? Are you going to hide that? I don't know, but I can't let the truth get out. Yeah, no. I mean, he definitely played it well because I hated his guts the entire time he was doing it. That's for no, sure. Well-written character. Yeah. But that scene, like, uh, it's it's really where we get the big exposition for the whole film. You you understand that this is some government funded thing. Um, there is a classified document on it, and the monsters or whatever they are underground, right, are all because of this. And that's, I mean, to me, that's a big turning point for the film. This is when the movie turns from a who done it, what the hell's going on, uh, these three random guys storylines moving along, right, um, to Okay, everyone is now all in. Um, Bosch is hell bent on figuring out what's down in the sewers. Reverend is obviously already trying to figure it out, and even Cooper's yeah. starting to get dragged in because of Marvin, the journalist. Well, I get so they could have gotten rid of George. They could have just cut him and Lauren out of the film, and this would have been a better movie. And it's not. I'm not saying anything against John Hurd. He may have had some of the stronger acting in the film. Same with his girlfriend Lauren. But if you cut them out. A lot of the movies just better. Uh, going back to the scene, though, that we're talking about, when Marv, I'm just going to call him Marv from now on, when Reverend Marv leaves, the, he goes to the payphone and the guy just takes his change out and, like, swallows it. And <laughs> he's got this guy following him now. And then this guy, like, tries to secretly kill him. 
I don't, I don't know, man. Like, there's so much shit happening in this film. Well, I mean, thanks a lot, Wilson. Once again, you know, he called the guy down to go tail um, the Reverend Shepherd and and eat the change. Like, well, he didn't tell him to eat the change, but he told him to not make that call. So, ah, oh, man, yeah, that's that's wasn't a he, like, that's a weird scene too, because there wasn't isn't a... he telling George too at some point? Mm-hmm. Like yep. at the very beginning, he was telling him for what reason, like he was taking pictures of homeless people. That's never explained. So what's funny is he calls someone. You don't know who he's talking to. You assume he's talking to Bosch, right? From the precinct. And instead, I don't think he was talking to Bosch. I think he was talking to Wilson. And Wilson when told him. He was talking him, to that. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I think, I think, he was I think Wilson to told him. reporter guy. Well, so, so Bosch is walking out talking to the reporter guy. But the dude who tails... Uh, Reverend is also the guy who tailed Cooper from the precinct when Cooper went to pick up the homeless chick who tried to steal the gun. He gets a phone call in the precinct and he's yeah. like, hey, um, you know, Cooper's leaving right now and, and something's up. And then, um, but I mean, maybe it was Bosch because then later on he goes, sorry, Captain, lost him. You know, I must have lost him or whatever. He's got to be talking to Bosch. I don't know. It's very funny, though, that it's the same guy who then you know, goes and tails uh, Shepard. Right. I don't, yeah, there, Do I guess like there's some learning, pieces I don't get. Did you like learning what Chud meant in that meeting? Cannibaloid, humanoid, cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers. I, Here's I, one. <laughs> it's dead. <laughs> I That's the open that I'm going to use for this episode uh, from our intro is, is uh, Wilson uh, saying that. So, yes, I actually did like that. I thought I thought it was kind of funny. It's the way you said it is just so corny and off key, and it's like okay. And then we find out later on that's not what it stands for because of course they're storing toxic waste underground, and that's what's creating these monsters because these homeless people who live underground have turned into these these chuds or monsters, and the the canisters have the have the uh, acronym chud on them, which stands for uh, I think containment hazard urban disposal close yeah yeah contamination hazard tell? urban disposal contamination yeah contamination hazard urban disposal so it's stupid that and we get a sequel called chud 2 and which has nothing to do with this film but we we learn what chud means when they <laughs> see all these weird guys in these masks kind of dancing around slopping and sloshing with this toxic waste and they decide to kind of gas underground, and the police officers, that's going to send them all up. And the other guy's like, I don't care. And so we meet John Goodman because of this. John Goodman, best character in the film, in my <laughs> opinion. He's a police officer. He's, he's flirting with this waitress, and he's, he's like checking tail. out her ass. Yeah. Yeah, he's looking at her ass, and he's like, that's a nice piece right there. And she's like, I heard that. And he's like, oh. What are you well, doing after work or whatever? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, you're asking for it. He's like, I'm always asking for it. I just never get it. And and he delivers the lines so well. This is great. So it's well. So, so natural. Good. It's his seventh yeah. acting gig, right? To be accurate, it's his seventh acting gig. He did this the same year that he did Revenge of the Nerds, which is amazing because he's the coach uh, in that. And then he's playing this cop who's hitting on some lady in Chud. Like, it's just... It's mind bending to think about I think all that's the his personality. Yeah, these different <laughs> that's roles. Because even even later on in Roseanne, when he's the dad, I mean, he's still very much so just John Goodman. It's him. Um, Let's be frank. John Goodman is a fantastic actor, and if oh, you I haven't the seen, uh, what was the uh, the the horror film he did? Uh, oh, a couple of years Cloverfield ago, Cloverfield Lane. Cloverfield Lane, yes. That was probably the best role he's ever been in. Is it 10 Cloverfield or Cloverfield? Either way, it's something like I, that. I but yeah, remember. it's a part of the whole Cloverfield, uh, you know, franchise and universe. Um, it originally wasn't related to it, which if it wasn't, I would, probably would have liked it more. But even then, great movie. I love that movie as a standalone, uh, but also like to think about how it has some tie-ins. I think it's fun. I don't think it's great, right? Um, well, that was last minute connection but we can talk about that when we watch it um, if we ever watch it i think we can i don't know if i want to <laughs> that's not your call all right who is our main pro <laughs> uh, protagonist 
We don't have a main protagonist. We have three protagonists. Uh, no, Bosch so frustrating. Bosch gets shot. Uh, I mean, Lauren gets chased around. Uh, Cooper is just kind of here and there in random places all at once. And Reverend, the Reverend's the one who actually does things. He's yeah. the one who figures it all out and handles the handles the goofy stuff. He's the one that that kills uh kills the main villain of the film mm-hmm. with the his one eye open shot. If I had to pick a single protagonist, I'd have to go with the Reverend. I think he's more I think he's more involved in every aspect. Not that he does more than everyone else, but I definitely feel like he does personally. I think he does. But yeah, I'd pick I'd pick the Reverend. I would remove George Cooper, I would remove Lauren again, and I would just keep Bosch and uh and Marv or Shepard, whatever you want to call him, Shepard Reverend. Just uh yeah, no, I this movie's great, not because of the story, it's great because of the aspect of the monsters actually being frightening. They set them up to be scaring cause it's scary because they're eating homeless people, right? They're they're taking them off the street, people are going we're missing. Cops don't care. They don't they don't care until the Reverend brings it up to Bosch and then they find a Geiger counter and they figure out that there's actually monsters and they that whole scene where they figure out there are monsters from the government guy that makes no sense. And then the government guy just causes problems from there. Yeah, I mean we got just, our antagonist for sure, so we know that. Um You yeah. you could remake this film today and it would still be good. I mean it's kind of been remade. Not not to the degree were they homeless people on us? Yeah. Were they eating homeless people? Were they just disappearing or I thought they were kind of clones so, or something. So they they are, they're human clones, but the idea was that they're um similar to how Chud the the cannibalistic humanoid underground dwellers are mm-hmm. biting into the homeless people and turning them into um Chuds, right? I, like Victor. I they were eating them. No, but Victor turns at the end of the movie. You see his teeth. He's more like Bud the Chud than. Um, yeah, he starts turning. Yeah, so you you can see where when they when they bite them, even if if they don't eat them, um, they will become infected and turn into a Chud. Um, so we'll we'll get more into this, but Jordan Peele takes a lot of inspiration from Chud um, when it comes to the the idea of the um, social commentary, even that that he's trying to do where he's talking about people who are being marginalized by the government um, and how in his film, he's, he's showing that even today, the same stuff is happening um, where, where communities are being marginalized by the U S government and they're being forgotten about. um, And he wants to bring awareness to them. And he uses these tunnel tunnel dwellers to be as like a stand in for today's version of that. Whereas back in the eighties, that that was exactly um, our director's opinion as well. That's what he was shooting for, um, Douglas Cheek. So that that was his idea of of showing it off. So that's where I feel like we do kind of have a remake. Um, if you haven't so I, seen I would... us, I would say check it out for sure. What I've seen of us, um, because I have a, a one month old, I've had to watch it. I fall asleep, watch it. You know, try and figure out where I was. So. For me, it's very pieced together, but it's it's a really well made film. Um, so I would still think you, you could remake like Chud, like the actual Chud movie itself. We have the monsters. I get rid of the whole turning into one thing for one. Just have them kind of show up, and people just go missing. People who are marginalized, we don't really care about. Created and from government toxic crap underground, or how would you be the or how what would be the turning for them? It would definitely be something from the government. It wouldn't be like some sort of lab lab made thing. We wouldn't explain how they transformed. Okay. Whenever you do that, that usually makes things bad. Like, like if there's toxic waste underground or some sort of waste that they're disposing of, they don't explain what the chud is. Right. They don't explain what that waste is. It's just radioactive, and for whatever reason, it turns people into these monsters or mutants. But yeah, I don't know, man. I th- I think you could remake this film in a way where they're trying to get rid of them. They fuck up. The monsters go above ground and they start attacking people above ground. And from there, we from actually, and not having a clear resolution of what happens to these monsters at the end of the, this film, I feel like that would be a change that we would need to make. There would actually need to be some sort of resolution. 
or some sort of shine sign to say like, hey, remember those monsters? They're either gone or there's still some left. Yeah, I think having no real end to the movie is very hard. Um, yeah. Because you get left with that feeling of nothing was resolved. Um, but that just ties more to me into the social commentary that we that we're getting is that yeah, we they you just know, killed G-Man. <laughs> yeah, you you got that's our resolution. G-Man dies. Yeah. I don't know, man. This movie's. I, I I'd watch it again for fun. Oh yeah, totally. Especially just to, if I just to get reactions. Especially if I turn off the whole social commentary bit now, you know, and watch it. Um. You know, using it as an escape method versus a, hey, I want to feel something necessarily at this moment, I could watch it again anytime. Um, but knowing what it's trying to portray as well is kind of tough now. You, you know, it makes me want to stand up and fight and do something more than just sit back and, and watch a movie. Um, so you got to, I have to be careful there personally whenever I watch movies and not dwell too much on what they were trying to do in 1984. Just, just the same way with like they live, right? Back to our main points here that I want to close with. Just a couple of things. Um, and then I have some random factoids that I think will be well, fun. I want to I go over my theory still. Perfect. So let me hit with uh, my opinion on Ch Chud 2. Because we did Chud 2 uh, last season, right? So Chud 2 was a part of our last season. Um, absolutely love that film. But now having gone back and watched Chud again, they should not have been tied together. And you and I talked about this nope. before. Um, it should have been called mm -hmm. something else. I have a, I, the way I feel about it is it's the same way I feel about Halloween three season of the witch should have been kept separate. Okay. Shouldn't have been tied with the Chud name or the Halloween name. Um, and as standalone films, the Chud two would have been great if it would have been called something else. Right. And Halloween right. three would have been great had it been called something else, but because they get tied to these franchises, um, can't even call Chud a franchise really two films, is not a franchise, nope. but halloween on the other hand right so that's my opinion on that i absolutely love both films but for completely different reasons chud 2 is a lot of fun to me whereas chud is way more serious toned so that's my last bit realistically on the film i don't think i have anything else in here that i need to talk about so let's get so, to your fun theory. so to go back on this with what you just said what chud 2 was originally meant to be a sequel to Return of the Living Dead, I believe, and I believe the company lost the rights to, and this is this is just off the top of my head. I don't have the, the stuff in front of me. We talked about this in that episode of Bud the Chud. Go check it out. But it was meant to be a Night of the Living Dead film, and instead they lost the rights or they, they changed uh, filming companies or I'm not sure what happened, but then they're like, okay, this is what we have the rights to, and they're like, oh, we'll take Chud, and they very one moment they're like cannibaloid humanistic underground dwellers and then they talked about a new type of chud and that's what bud was who gets revived by weird science but they're not connected you're right we had this conversation earlier to uh kind of talk about my theory though mm -hmm. my theory this is a prequel to home alone <laughs> get ready boys and girls it's gonna get good so Home Alone was actually an inside job planned out by Kevin McAllister's dad, who is Cooper in this film, who, you know, he had another girlfriend on the side and he broke up with Lauren or she's still there, but he married that redhead, you know, and the other, the other girl is just kind of a side piece. He had a kid with her. He had his family with the other lady. And he's like, you know what? My son, Kevin, is a little bitch. So he calls up Marv, right? And he's like, Marv or Reverend, as he used to go by as a street name. You know, the Sticky Bandits to come by and rob his house. The names have been changed to to hide their identities, okay? So yeah, he goes by or, Marv in Home Alone, right? Well, maybe Marv was his, his real name, because the, only, the only name we have is Shepard, so maybe it's Marv Shepard. Maybe. Maybe, who knows? Anyhow, I think Marv was the mastermind and just acted like an idiot as part of the sneak, Sticky Bandits. And that makes Home Alone a lot more fun to watch, in my opinion. <laughs> well done, well done. <laughs> um, this uh, is almost as, this, 
Yeah. No, this is almost as crazy as my Jason one that I had a while back. Um, Your Jason one? Yeah. What did I do? I like I tried to tie all these things together on Friday the 13th, and I can't remember what it was from. And I felt I felt like I was making a very clear, good case, but no one really mm. – I don't think anyone really caught on and agreed with it. So hopefully yours will take off. Let's, let's get this trending. It, let's get this it trending. Won't. <laughs> Nobody's going to watch Chud. Uh, if you if you're watching Chad, uh, Chud, Chad, Chad. If you're watching Chad, please <laughs> tweet hey, at Chad, us. If you're watching Chad, Chad, make sure to uh, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, All right, are we bell. are we ready for fun facts and some trivia? Yeah, I think so. Cap. Uh, so I got a couple of random factoids here. So Patricia Richardson, uh, which is the mother from Home Improvement, she actually plays the ad woman in this film. Um. Another character who I think was a lot of cool to see on this script list was J.C. Quinn, who plays Quinn, uh, who plays Quinn, is from Maximum Overdrive. So he's the young kid's dad who ends up getting diesel fuel in his eyes and going blind, and then gets ran over by one of the diesel trucks later on. Um, if you haven't seen Maximum Overdrive, check it out. I love it. I think it's a lot of fun. It does not age well, but it's still a lot of fun. Um, okay, so some more normal factoids in issue thirty-two of Fangoria. Andrew Bonheim referred to the film as an expensive looking film and an expensive concept. It's a high quality kind of picture. In for, uh, to, <laughs> sure for that time, I I'd exactly. Agree. I was just about to say in 2020, I wouldn't agree with you, but in 1984, I think so. Um, okay, so this is the relief, the 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 fun factoid that I like the most because there's a whole article that I read on it. Um, but apparently, Jordan Peele's Us takes a ton of inspiration from Chud. Um, there's a quote from Hannah Cheek, which is the daughter of a director of Chud. Um, that is, it says, he loved Chud. Um, at my house, we had a manhole cover from the set, and I remember Jordan being really excited. He was definitely clear that it was in his arsenal of favorites. So the very first scene of Us shows the old school VHS tape, which I still own, of Chud. Uh, right next to the TV while the daughter is watching the, uh, what is it, Hearts Across America intro. Um, but yeah, you can see Chud sitting there, um, which is pretty cool. And then the the other pieces that really, you know, it connects, and the reason why it, I, I like to say it's a good uh, new age remake of Chud, even though it's really not a remake, it is its own film, but Us takes place in a world that is vastly... Um, it's like a huge community, right, of these human clones. And that's what we were talking about earlier. But they've been left to fend for themselves. So what do they do? They go down into abandoned tunnels beneath the U.S. Um, after some failed experiment from the government. And then they use these tunnel dwellers to be the uh, stand in marginalized communities that the, the U.S. government has forgotten about even furthermore, um, which is that social commentary, that similar idea, which if you watch Jordan Peele's films you you know that there's always this social commentary behind the scenes of the horror movie um which is a lot of fun in my opinion get out has it um us has it as well and um he's the host of twilight zone so you can only imagine the fun that he gets to have uh being on that show as well but yeah the it's for for a 1984 film to have um kind of this inspiration on something that we're watching as a new film today in 2020 to me, that's amazing. That's that's that just shows how great of a film um, Chud was for its time, right? Um, I think it aged okay, in my think opinion. So? Yeah, I think it aged okay. Chud? Yeah. You think it's aged? I I think um, uh, I don't agree. I don't think, I think it's, it's. I don't think I can't <clears throat> watch it. You know what I mean? Like. Uh, yeah. I don't think this is a bad horror movie. But I definitely don't think it's a good horror movie. I think this is a very watchable film. But I also think it's a very aged film. That it's going to take a, you know, not everybody's going to like it. Right. I don't know. I don't know how to define it. It's kind of, you can tell this is made in the time it was made. Because back then, this is before, uh, no, it's kind of during the whole Jason festival or fest with movies but this movie kind of takes itself serious this is so definitely serious. more of a serious tone film yeah yeah so serious but at the same time the direction is is lacking um 
but I'm I'm interested the whole film. Like I'm I'm watching it and I, I I don't lose track of what's going on. Some things it's like why, why that never comes back. That never comes back. So here's why. Otherwise, so here's why. I'm gonna tell you right now. This is the reason why this film definitely feels not perfect, right? Not polished, is because Douglas Cheek, Parnell Hall, and Shepard Abbott all. This is their only film. This is the only screenplay Parnell Hall's ever written. This is the only story Shepard Abbott's ever written himself. Um, and this is the only film that Douglas Cheek has actually directed. They, they, they weren't, I don't know, they weren't good enough to keep going maybe? Or maybe they did, they just, this was it? I mean, I would love I to have more detail about it, but they're not, they're not like well-seasoned directors or writers the the you could definitely feel that right i mean we that keep talking about it yeah that doesn't give them a, that that's not an excuse for this mess of just everything's happening all at once and whoever i, mean, I think it's a great excuse script, i think it's a great I don't excuse think so. i don't i don't agree with that especially not for a big budget film i i, I would argue that somebody should have come in there and re reviewed the script and gone over the at post but, you know, compared to a lot of films at this time, I'm sure it's just your standard go-to horror movie. I'm not going to lie to you. I think the first I think the first Friday the 13th movie is kind of just a hodgepodge of random garbage, too. But I, I'd say this is, you know, a film of its time, for sure. Back when people could just direct a movie and make what they wanted to make. So I wonder when New World Pictures bought the rights to the movie or if they funded the movie because it was also released under Chud Productions, which obviously this is the only film under Chud Productions. But this definitely feels more like a – there was no one to read that script, dude. Like there was no one to polish the edges and to help take it to the next level. Um, so, so I don't know. I mean the fact that they were solo artists working on this together – and you know maybe they just this is the best they could come up with and that's that's why it doesn't feel as polished um i i think it's highly possible um that they just didn't have gone yeah they just didn't they didn't have the ability to get more eyes on the script or or better reviews but i i would that's something fun that would be uh interested to look into more so i'm looking at some of this stuff uh <clears throat> A lot of, lot of, okay, so Douglas Cheek was an, mainly an editor, uh, which a producer to a couple things. Claustrophobia, interesting, interesting. I, I got, you know, I like this film. I'd like to see it remade. That's all I have to say. Yeah, I think that would be fun. I think a, a remake of Chud is something that you could actually do nowadays and get away with it, and it'd be possibly better than the original. Well, Jordan Peele did remake it with us, kind of spiritually. I guess I need to watch it and stop stop saying what I'm saying. Well, I mean, I think us would be a lot of fun to watch. Uh, another movie related to this is Street Trash, which if you have not seen it, it's just kind of a gore fest film. Um, there's this alcoholic beverage they find in like the walls of this store, and the guy just sells it to the homeless, and like just a bunch of people, home, just a whole bunch of homeless people melting the entire film. So I have heard of Street Trash. Uh, Horror Movie Night did it, um, I think, a while back, or they they talk about it quite often just because of how gory it is. Um, one of Hideo Kojima's favorite movies. I think it would be a fun one to do. Ah, you know, I'm going to have to be in the right mood to watch that. Well, but like me with Clover, the Cloverfield movie, it's, it's very, and you with this street trash it could happen i'll do it for you i'll do it for you <laughs> so do you have anything else on chud or shall we move into the next part of our show i'm done man let's talk about let's talk about what we're up to right now and then we can go into our plugs perfect why don't you go ahead and go first because mine's going to be wanna... a little bit more long-winded i don't want to do that <laughs> you're not are you not ready why are you making me go first what do you make it? I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> hey, it's July 11th. Uh, what we're doing, what I'm doing this month. Um, <laughs> I, I, 
We are filming, obviously, or recording a little bit in advance, right? So um, for the month of July, what I've been doing is watching along with the Mutant Fam. Um, you can check out what they're up to at MutantFam.com. We're located at the very bottom with the podcast section. Um, we're one of the, the podcasts that are a part of this group. Um, but something that they're doing this month, which is really awesome, is called the Fulai. Uh... What? Oh. Huh. What did we become a part of Mutant Fam? A while back. I've been working on it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we're not like, they just put our shows there. Nothing like super fancy or anything. Tell us more. But on mutantfam.com slash F-U hyphen L-Y. So if you watch Joe Bob stuff, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Foo, lie. Um, it's all the foo things that uh, Joe Bob loves to list out before the episodes. But... Every day of the month of July, we're watching a different uh, Last Drive-In episode. Um, today is the 11th, so it is Troma's War, um, which he just did actually in season two. But you know, they they just they want to keep the Last Drive-In um, fun and excitement going. So every day of the month, mm -hmm. they're just doing a different pre-selected episode. Um, you want to use the hashtags the Last Drive-In and Fulai. Uh, whenever you are tweeting out that you're watching it and other people will join in on the conversation and we can all come together and keep that mutant family um, last drive-in never dies fun going for the month of July. Very cool. Heck yeah. Dude, I'm excited. I'm on this website right now. I'm seeing all the stuff I have. There's like some, there's like some recipes here as well. This yeah. just seems like a very uh, nice community to, to be a part of. Yeah, I mean, I've been you, uh... <laughs> I've been hanging out with them every every Friday, pretty much for the last drive-in. Um, and Mutant Cafe is is a lot of fun to watch because you can learn about new types of food, different things to make, and they try to usually have like theme inspired food for um, the last drive-in episodes. But with the July stuff, I'm not really sure if they're doing themed food, and I know they're not doing it, you know, every Friday probably. Um, right now because you know it's every single day so that'd be kind of hard for them to do but um you i think you were asking how did i find out about them yeah so was it through twitter <laughs> twitter yes yeah no, i i i check uh, i check it on your twitter conversations every once in a while and it's a uh, yeah i i know like you you meet and talk to a lot of cool people and it's really it's really interesting man you're very uh if anybody listening to this wants to talk to Curtis, if, if you add him on Twitter, he will talk to you right away. If you want to pick any movie you want to watch, he will he'll put that movie in our queue and we will watch it for you and we'll have a conversation about it. For instance, Hot Crack Rat, we are actually doing Southbound uh, next week. It'll get released on the 18th. Mm. So she uh, reached out on Twitter. She was having a conversation with me about something. And I asked her, hey, what are your favorite types of horror movies? And she said, I really love gore movies. And I go, I'm not a big fan of gore. I haven't like gone through and watched a bunch of different type of gore films. Give me a few or give me your favorite and we'll do an episode um, just to, to you know have some more commentary with you on Twitter. Um, so she suggested that we watch a movie called Southbound from 2015. And it just so happens that we had a, I had a free slot where I didn't really have a movie that I wanted to pick just yet. Um, mm -hmm. So I threw it in there. So that's what we're going to be watching probably this week um, and recording next week uh, to come out on the 18th. So look I forward am, to that. I am absolutely terrified. Absolutely terrified. I think the goriest film I've ever watched is Terrifier. Um, that's the first one that comes gory. to mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty gory that's as gory as i get like i don't know man i'm i'm scared so thank you for that uh, thank you for making me watch something that's going to make me squirm um <laughs> i'm going to be very uncomfortable the entire time perfect for me <laughs> have i have i bought you enough time to tell us what you've got going on lately what you're doing yeah i mean i don't know if i want to i want to share this on the podcast or not but i i started my own like my own individual uh, little 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 project here. Yes, talk about it. Tell the people. It's called it's called the Clark Cast. It is not related to horror at all. Uh, it's my name with A S T at the end, C L A R K A S T, 
and I am it's it's on the same platforms that we are on here with two guys and some horror. There's a link in the uh, description. Okay, well, thank you for that. <laughs> I talk more about things that are pertaining to psychology, things that may help individuals, things that are, I don't know, kind of relatable on a more glo global scale than just kind of horror, like is more niche, something that like people show an interest in. The first episode of my podcast, we talk about suicide and depression, where a friend of mine reached out to a bunch of my friends, called the police on me, found found my address, and he was worried that I was going to kill myself, which I wasn't. I was drunk, and I said something stupid to him and went to, and just like passed out and fell asleep, which I haven't drank ever since. But um, it was a very that's a very serious conversation. And then the most recent one I did was with a friend of mine, Laurel. Uh, on how to be more confident and how to deal with kind of feelings like, oh, I'm not good enough. And I'm hoping that, you know, with this podcast, we can help someone or be able to become more self-aware or even get to the point of like finding a work-life balance with the conversation I'm going to have with Jordan tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, if you want to check me out, it's just C-L-A-R-K-A-S-T. I'm on Spotify. I'm on the same podcasting situation whatever you're listening to on now i'm probably there i don't think i'm on apple yet though but you will be soon because you use perhaps anchor.fm i do use anchor <laughs> okay um i think we've hit all of our main points the last thing that we always like to do is plug our social media I think i've talked about it enough so i'm just gonna throw the ad at you guys it is at the number two guys horror pod on twitter and instagram check us out come hang out and if you want to email us shoot us a suggestion or just email us to talk it's the number two or it's the word two guys and some horror at gmail.com um feel free to reach out um yeah we we don't get a ton of email so if you guys want to maybe please shoot me an email tell me to you watch a movie <laughs> Tell me to no watch a movie. What, they say. <laughs> <laughs> what movie do you want to watch next? We're going to watch The Sound of Music, by the way, for our Halloween episode. Oh, uh, hell no, we're not. Have you looked oh, at the you, board? Are you kidding me? That movie's terrifying. Sure the Hills is. Are Alive? But have you looked? The Hills Are Alive with Dead Bodies. <laughs> um, have you looked at our board? The I've got eyes. I've got Halloween set up for us beautifully. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. We love you guys. Uh, and we'll see you guys next week for a listener-picked movie. Oh, I'm so terrified. Bye.